Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our presentation today. Today is the final and last NOAA Science uh, Report Seminar, and we are very excited to host this with some amazing speakers today. My name is Katie. I'm with the NOAA Central Library, and I will be your technical host today. So if you um, a few logistics, if you notice we are on GoToWebinar, Go to webinar if there are any issues with it, such as you can't hear me or you can't see the slides. Best thing to do is to log off and log back in. That should solve most issues. We are recording this seminar. So if you um, have to step away, if you want to uh, listen to a different uh, talk at the time, at, right, at the moment, totally fine. We are recording this. It will be up on the library's YouTube channel afterwards. Also, we are taking questions, but those questions will be uh, asked at the very end of the presentation. So we have about five, uh, we have five talks to get through and then we will have um, questions at the end. So please stick around for all of those. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator today, Judy Garadelli. Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar on a robust and effective research development and trans transition enterprise the last of five seminars in the NOAA Science Report seminar series. The sponsors for this seminar series include the NOAA Research and Development Enterprise Committee, or RDEC, and the NOAA Central Library. I want to thank the NOAA Library staff, especially Katie Rowley, for their valuable assistance. I am Judy Ghirardelli, and I am one of the NOAA National Weather Service representatives on the RDEC, which is a cross-line office committee with the NOAA Science Council. The NOAA Science Report is an annual report that highlights NOAA's scientific accomplishments for the year and reflects NOAA's research priorities. The RDEC is responsible for the development of the NOAA Science Report with input from contributors from NOAA. The 2021 NOAA Science Report spans the entire range of NOAA's mission with more than 60 stories that represent the accomplishments of NOAA employees, as well as NOAA's partners. The report was just released last week on the NOAA Science Council website, so please check it out. Today, we welcome four speakers featured in the 2021 NOAA Science Report and whose science addresses the robust and effective research, development, and transition enterprise. The full bios for the speakers today can be found in the website description of today's webinar. So I will just provide the names and affiliations of our speakers in order to save more time for their presentations. Our speakers are Jeff Craven, Chief of the Statistical Modeling Division of the National Weather Service Meteorological Development Lab. Dr. Steve Montsock, Mont, Mons, Monska, excuse me, I had it right when I, when I practiced it. Dr. Steve Monska, Senior Scientist for the Global Monitoring Laboratory. Dr. Gregory Dusek, Senior Scientist at the National Ocean Service, and Dr. Sinead Farrell, Associate Professor, Associate in the Geographical Sciences and Atmospheric and Ocean Science Department at the University of Maryland. Each of the four speakers will give an eight-minute presentation, and then we'll have a question and answer session after all the presentations. So with that, I'd like to invite Gregory Dusek, to start our presentations. Greg will be presenting on the first ever National Rip Current Model Launch. Greg, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Judy. Um, and uh, thank you all for having us. Um, also joining me is Andre van der Susan, who is the Ocean Task Lead at IMSG uh, at Weather Service uh, NSEP EMC. Um, and we're going to be talking about how we launched the first ever national rip current forecast model or rip current model. And uh, uh, pardon any ch chat here in the background. I'm watching a toddler today, sick toddler. So um, in terms of what we're going to cover, just give you a quick introduction of the, the approach, um, uh, a little bit about rip currents and, and what we did to operationalize the model. Uh, first off, uh, I want to make sure we thank the NWPS, the Near Shore Wave Prediction System uh, project team. With uh, without you know without this team's effort and and other people as well, uh, none of this would have been possible. Uh, so first off, you know what what is a rip current? Um, Y'all might know this. You can see it there in this drone footage where there's the green dye uh, in the imagery. 
but rip currents are shoreward directed jets of water uh, that originate in the surf zone anywhere you have breaking waves. Um, they can reach speeds of up to five miles per hour, which might not sound that fast, but you know that's roughly the top speed of an Olympic swimmer. So really they can be a hazard uh, to anyone in the surf zone. Um, and as you may know, uh, they're one of the, the, the biggest public safety risks at the beach, really the number one safety risk at the beach, um, and, and are estimated to cause a significant number of drownings. So the recorded uh, rip-related drownings in the U.S. over the past five years, you can see here uh, with 90 from uh, preliminary from 2021. So last year was a record. Um, and the total number of drownings is estimated to be about 100 per year. Um, we, just many drownings don't go recorded as rip related. And so since these are a huge safety risk, you know, it's something we've tried to work on is, is being able to provide the public forward looking guidance on if we expect to see hazardous rip currents uh, in the near future so they can be prepared and hopefully save lives. Um, and so this work started over a decade ago when I was a student at UNC Chapel Hill. And the question was, can we accurately forecast rip currents? Um, there was some existing guidance from the Weather Service for a few decades now, but that was really kind of now cast guidance um, and not really forward looking. And so for this, we to, to do this, we collected information about the shape of the bottom. Uh, you can see there on the left doing near shore transects of the bathymetry, uh, looking at near shore waves using acoustic Doppler current profilers like you see there in the middle. And then collecting information about rip currents. And we to do that, we use light uh, So we work closely with the Kill Devil Hills Ocean Rescue Group on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, where they would record whether they saw hazardous rip currents or not, and also give us information about when they were making rip current rescues. And so we're able to use that information to create a rip current model to predict rip current likelihood. And this model um, is a machine learning model or a, a statistical model, if you will. Um, and it relies on four inputs uh, or four contributors to rip current likelihood. And that's significant wave height, wave direction, water level, which is mostly the tide, and then a post wave event, uh, which is a which is a bathymetry proxy. In other words, uh, a, a proxy for what the shape of the bottom is. So the shape of the bottom contributes to rip currents. It's really hard to measure and predict. And so what we ended up doing was say, if there is a big wave event, we found out the shape of the bottom would often be favorable after that event. And so we use that as a predictor. Um, these four predictors go into the model, a logistic regression model, and it outputs uh, hazardous rip current likelihood from zero to one or zero to 100%. Um, and we're able to predict that um, you know, on a given hour and a given location, um, as long as we have this input data. And when we created the model, we found it was a 67% improvement to existing, kind of that existing index-based threshold that I mentioned before. Um, and so it showed a lot of promise, and we really thought this could be something useful on a national scale. But the problem was, is we had no way at the time to really provide the wave and water level data we needed in a forward-looking sense to be able to predict rip currents, you know, hours and days ahead across the country. And so what enabled us to do that is the nearshore wave prediction system. And that's what we've been working on over the past um, uh, several years to be able to operationalize the model. And so I'll, I'll pass it to Andre to take off, uh, take over from here. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, so the initial wave prediction system provides um, six-day forecast at an hourly level, um, on demand driven by forecast offices uh, along the coast all around the country. And so in this image top left, you can see, um, for example, the, the, the Moorhead City domain um, forecast that we produce with the NWPS system. And so these run on unstructured meshes, which has variable resolution from the offshore to the nearshore. By the time you get to the nearshore, the resolution is down to 100 meter resolution. So based on that, we're able to extract along the five meter depth contour, the predictors that go into the logistic regression model that drives the rip current prediction. So we have all of the predictors that uh, Greg mentioned at an hourly resolution going out to six days. So because of that, we can then implement the logistic regression model at each one of our output points. And these are typically at intervals of 500 meters to a kilometer all along the coastal contour into the, into the NWPS model. And so as a result, we can run these statistical models, which are very cheap to run um, once developed and once trained, very cheap to run. So we can output rip current guidance all along the coastline. And so in the bottom left image there, you can see then uh, as a color-coded output classification of rip currents of low, medium, and high, 
in this case mostly high with the red contour, all along the coastline. So we're able to produce this uh, consistently along entire stretches of the, Uf the US coastline. So on the next slide, we see what the guidance looks like in terms of hourly resolution. And so on the bottom, uh, on the horizontal axis is a time. And you can see at the top, in the top panel is the probability of recurrent between zero and one. And then below them are the various predictors that go into the system. So significant wave height, uh, mean wave period, mean wave direction, relative to shore normal and the water level. And so you can see the distinct links between higher wave heights, um, uh, lower tidal levels with, with uh, resulting in higher levels of rip current prediction. And so periods of lulls, you can also see reduction in the risk of the rip current. So that pro this provides the first ever hourly resolution out to uh, six days of the recurrent probability at um, significant long stretches of the US coastline. So currently this is implemented for the eastern region, southern region and Pacific region. Um, and so for all of these regions currently operationally, this guidance has been provided. The next slide discusses the validation that we did for this system. So this is now in the operational system um, deployed over large stretches of the US. So validation can be done either by lifeguard observations, direct observations, so with instrumentation in the water, or remote sensing, for example, with webcams. Um, so the, the latter two have interesting challenges that, that we're working on. So the, the main observation validation work was done with the lifeguard observations. And so we collected from various forecast officers working with the lifeguards on their beaches um, data. So stretching in the examples here, from Miami in the south, from uh, and then also from Maryland to, to North Carolina. And so the images that you see there, these are reliability diagrams. So since we are uh, verifying probabilistic data, these are the most appropriate uh, metrics to use. So what we compare here is the forecasted probability um, uh, compared to the observed, um, um, the observed uh, frequency of the recurrence. And so what we see that if that line is on the one-to-one, -one, it means that we have a perfect uh, probability prediction um, from the recurrent system. Uh, we didn't quite achieve that. We, we get the line slightly above the one-to-one, -one, which indicates um, somewhat under forecasting. So the probability is somewhat lower than actually observed. However, nonetheless, um, for both of these areas, we found 22% improvement over climatology. And we found a 30% improvement at Miami over the existing Lushar index, which has been used traditionally by the Weather Service. Um, the last slide gives us um, some outlooks and some, um, some results. So this, as I mentioned, provides the first ever national rip current capability uh, out to six days on an hourly basis. And so this provides much more detailed information to forecasters and to lifeguards on actual rip current conditions today, but also into the future. Um, and so early next year, we plan to expand this also to Western region, and that we, then we'll have full national coverage. And the next scientific steps we're taking is to do a regional calibration of the system so that we have um, a statistical fit that, that matches local conditions better than currently. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg and Andre, for that great presentation. Our next speaker is Steve Monska. I think I have Steve next, Sinead. Is Steve there? Um, who will be discussing closing the loop on an apparent violation of the Montreal Protocol. Please take it away, Steve. Okay, thanks. Get some of these things out of the way here. Oops, sorry. Oh. I'm having trouble with the uh... can you see my presentation no i'm imagining I yes can. we can see your presentation okay very good okay yes yeah. so um thanks for joining me i hope to discuss with you um what we've been observing about emissions for cfc 11 uh, which is an ozone depleting gas the second most abundant ozone depleting gas in the atmosphere today and how the NOAA data that we've been able to acquire over time 
closes a loop on, a, on an apparent violation of the Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. The Montreal Protocol is an international agreement tasks with, tasked with guiding ozone layer recovery. And in addition to myself, there's a number of other folks involved in this project at the Global Monitoring Laboratory. Okay, so as an introduction, as a reminder, the ozone layer is critical for life on Earth because it filters out high energy UV radiation that damage humans, skin, eye, tissues, plants, and animals. Um, and it's without that ozone layer, life on Earth would be very different today, if, if, if not even non-existent. But in 1985, severe ozone layer depletion was detected over Antarctica. And within two years, an international effort to heal the ozone layer was begun, that is the Montreal Protocol, in which production of ozone depleting chemicals, the CFCs, for example, chlorofluorocarbon 11, was gradually reduced and ultimately by 2010 was fully phased out. And the NOAA data allows to track emissions and concentrations of CFCs. And we're able to determine that they started decreasing in the 1990s and early 2000s. But in 2018, GML scientists, including myself, were able to show that the global emission trend of F11 had reversed and emissions had started increasing after 2010, that date for the production ban. And a careful analysis that we were able to do, to do suggests that the internationally ratified and agreed upon Montreal Protocol perhaps had been violated. So the question for today is, and for the paper that we published in 2021, was how did CFC 11 emissions change since we published that paper in 2018? So what did we do exactly? Well, we continued to measure CFC 11 concentrations at remote sites around the world. And this is a map of the globe with sites indicated and different methods that we used. With the overarching goal of this program being to understand if the ultimate goal of the Montreal Protocol uh, is being achieved, that is to reduce these chemical concentrations. From that global atmospheric monitoring system, our measurements enable estimates of global emissions over time. And I've plotted here in the lower right panel, those emissions as estimated from the measurements and how they've changed over time since 2000 through 2012. And we see that overall those emissions were decreasing as expected. And we can expected that decline to continue, particularly because production was phased out in 2010, but instead we saw an emission increase. We were able to, in that 2018 study, to attribute some of that at global emission increase to be coming from Eastern Asia. The other thing we did is reach out to colleagues around the world also measuring CFC 11, particularly in the Eastern Asian region. And they were able to determine that China accounts for two thirds of this global emission increase that we detected. And we subsequently expanded our measurements in Eastern Asia to facilitate our ability to detect more accurately and precisely uh, emission changes in that region of the world. And we did this in collaboration with the Korean Meteorological Administration. But I think an important additional factor that we um, included here was that we directly communicated our findings to the Montreal Protocol, uh, to the parties of the Montreal Protocol. We, we, we attended their meetings in Vienna, Quito, Bangkok, and Rome during the 2018 to 20 period, directly interacting with delegates from many nations uh, in coordination with advisory panels to the Montreal Protocol. A separate side event spoke, focused specifically on the CFC 11 emission issue, and also with directly with US agency representatives to the Montreal Protocol. And here I show me interacting with colleagues at the EPA, and they subsequently did an analysis of the health effects of the increased CFC-11 emissions, uh, if they were to have been sustained indefinitely into the future, would have led to substantial higher rates of um, cancer, skin cancer, and eye disease in the future. So what did we find? I show in this figure two panels. One, showing the concentrations and how they've changed over time on the left side. 
and emissions on the right side. And you can see that when we published our paper, as indicated by the vertical line in both these panels, substantial changes were observed, a rapid response, both with the concentrations falling dramatically after we published our paper and with emissions dropping sharply in, in addition. Together with the results that we published it in 2021, we were able to determine um, with our colleagues that this global drop in emission was in large part from decreasing emissions in China. So they certainly had done substantial work to minimize those emissions that had happened uh, originally. So when we think about what this work was able to show, um, I believe it, it demonstrates that efforts to address the apparent violation to the Montreal Protocol were successful uh, in minimizing that activity and those associated with emissions. And as a result, delays in the ozone recovery are expected to be minimal and enhanced rates of disease that the EPA um, had, had uh, analyzed and, and quantified are expected to be small for the future related to this issue. It also heightened awareness of the importance of independent assessments of international policy commitments. I think this is particularly relevant when we think not only about ozone layer recovery, but also about climate change and greenhouse gas emission reductions in the future. In this instance, efforts are underway to improve the observational networks, both globally and nationally and within different regions, for example, China, to be able to provide better information to policymakers in, a more, in an even more timely fashion. And in my discussions with parties in different countries and country representatives, it's clear to me that there's been a renewed vigilance for minim minimizing ozone depleting gas emissions as a result of this issue. Um, I think with respect to societal relevant, relevance of this work, for me, it demonstrated the ability of the Montreal Protocol overall, all of the systems that the Montreal Protocol includes, advisory panels and different mechanisms for allowing the interaction between scientists, technologists, and policymakers. It demonstrated that structure to be able to effectively detect, address, understand and over, um, overcome what looked to be a substantial violation of the protocol. And so overall, even though it was a challenge to the protocol, I think it also strengthened that mantra protocol as loopholes that were identified as a result of the issue are being addressed and observational networks are being strengthened. So that overall, in my mind, the mantra protocol is much better positioned now to enable a full recovery of the ozone layer in the future. So um, here's the link to the paper that, that describes some of this result and look forward to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you, Steve, for that very interesting presentation. Our next speaker is Sinead Farrell, whose presentation is Investigating Changes in the Arctic Ocean and Subpolar Seas. Sinead, I'll turn it over to you now. Uh, well, thank you very much, Judy. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, Not thank there. you. Okay, super. Thank you, Judy. And also thanks to Katie and all of the NOAA library team, the central library team for um, preparing us for today's seminar. Um, so yes, as Judy mentioned, my name is Sinead Farrell um, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Maryland in College Park, but I'm working quite closely with the Laboratory for Satellite Altimetry, which is a team of remote sensing scientists who are part of NESDA's STAR in the Satellite Oceanography and Climatology Division, headed by uh, Dr. Paul DiGiacomo. So um, today, in terms of um, our presentation, let me see if I can, yeah. Um, we're going to focus primarily on the Bering Sea. Um, the Bering Sea is off the coast of Alaska. It is um, the um, transition between the Arctic Ocean in the north, uh, the Pacific Ocean in the south, um, and it's actually the third largest semi-enclosed sea in the world. Um, and as you can see from this beautiful, hopefully from this beautiful um, modus image of the Bering Sea, you can tell that it is seasonally uh, covered in sea ice. Uh, which is the topic um, of my research and uh, uh, of my research team. But the sea ice cover is dynamic. It changes throughout the year and it changes from year to year. Um, so in terms of the overall um, bathymetry 
of the Bering Sea. This sort of indicated, the map indicated on the right shows you the location of the inner shelf, middle shelf, um, and outer shelf on the eastern side of the Bering Sea versus the deeper um, ocean basin to the, <clears throat> excuse me, to the western part of the Bering Sea. Um, and you can see probably from this image that the uh, sea ice is primarily um, restricted to the shelf sea region. Um, and also in, indicated in this beautiful image is sort of the role that the sea ice plays in the climate of this region, where you can actually see that there's cold air blowing, northerly winds, so cold air blowing from the north to the south um, in this particular instance. Um, and that's indicated by these cloud streets which are parallel streams of clouds that occur over the open ocean. Um, and that's a result of cold air blowing over the warmer um, Pacific Ocean or, or the southern part of the Bering Sea here. So this is the um, region of interest for today's talk. And um, one of the primary drivers for this is, of course, um, the US commercial fisheries industry. Over half of um, the fish um, obtained through commercial fishing in the US is obtained in the Alaskan region um, and in particular um, in the Bering Sea uh, in which would include crab, um, pollock and Pacific cod fisheries um, and it accounts for over a billion dollars um, annually even up to two billion dollars annually in terms of revenue so it's a major um, industry in the Alaskan region. Um, and as I mentioned, um, most of my research is focused on sea ice and the loss of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And what we've seen in the Bering Sea over the last 10 years or so has been um, massive interannual variability in the sea ice extent. So here we're looking at maps of um, sea ice extent in April. The white area indicates the extent of that sea ice. Um, and what was concerning to us um, was the loss, dramatic loss of sea ice in 2018. Um, when we actually, which is shown here by the red curve, we uh, recorded the lowest sea ice extent on record since 1850. Um, and that was closely followed by another um, almost record setting sea ice minimum in uh, the winter of 2019. So two years in a row, we saw this um, very um, concerning loss and sudden loss of ice in the Bering Sea. So if we look at the trend of that over time, um, this is a graph of ice extent or basically the amount of um, area of the Bering Sea covered in sea ice per month um, that you can see for the winter months um, from November through to March or April that we're losing sea ice in every month of the year. Um, there's a declining trend for each of these months and probably the biggest losses are happening at the end of winter, which would be the March and April timeframe, so this time of the year in the Bering Sea. So, um, and, and if we look at the map, um, mapping of that distribution, the biggest changes are happening over that inner shelf area um, and middle shelf area. So in around St. Matthews, um, St. Lawrence's, St. Lawrence Islands, um, uh, the Norton Sound region of the Northern Pacific, uh, Northern Bering Sea. Um, so the consequences of this are that there's record breaking warming in ocean temperatures in this region through the loss of the sea ice cover. Um, bottom temperatures have been uh, record breaking in the last several years. And the major consequence of this on the fisheries is that the Arctic fish species are retreating northwards. And um, since they, they re re uh, rely on a cold pool of water that forms beneath the sea ice here on the inner and middle shelves of the Bering Sea, and species that are associated with the southern part of the Bering Sea are extending northwards, so that includes um, the Red King Crab, um, so that's expanding its territory northwards. Um, so the major drivers of this change, just to summarize, are above normal air temperatures in the region, warming ocean temperatures, and the effect of winter storms. Um, so our research is really focused on this winter storm aspect, um, and we're looking at how frequent winter storms are in the Bering Sea. Um, the trend in those winter storms, we're looking that, at that by looking at both reanalysis data, looking at wind speed, wind conditions, but also by using satellite altimetry to look at significant wave height in the Bering Sea. So how the sea state in the Bering Sea has changed. 
um, and the impacts of that on the sea ice cover. Ultimately, we want to know as the ice cover has retreated and the fetch in the Bering Sea has increased, has the overall sea state increased or become more stormy, basically. So, oh, sorry. Um, winter storms are really common in the Bering Sea and they're really nasty. Um, basically, they can produce um, waves of over 40 feet, 12 meters. Um, and really what our re uh, research is focused on are the WMO sea states of very high and phenomenal seas. So anything over 30 feet, basically nine meters and taller waves. I just get seasick thinking about that. Um, and the, the winter storms that we're really talking about are severe extra tropical cyclones or large cyclones, often a result of typhoons in the Pacific that drift north into the Bering Sea. Um, and bomb cyclones. So this is just an example of the extra tropical um, typhoon Lan in October of 2017, when the pressure, the low pressure system here was about 936 hectopascals. So very severe storms. Um, and we, when we look at the um, persistence or uh, frequency of these storms overall, um, over the last 20 years, we don't really see a trend or a significant trend in the number of cyclones in the Bering Sea over time, apart from the two winter months of January and, um, sorry, December and January. So um, we can see a slight increase in the number of winter storms, that's the individual cyclones. But if we map the overall wind speed, so now we're looking at the mean wind speed of the Bering Sea, we can see that the, there is a linear trend in mean wind speed increase, particularly in the months of December, February and March in the Bering Sea. Um, and if we look at the intensity of the wind, um, we're doing this by looking at the 99th percentile of wind speed, we can see that the intensity of the wind or the storm has also been increasing over the study period, which um, I should have mentioned is about the last 20 to 25 years. So then just to um, move into what's happening with the ocean, um, we're using, as I mentioned, satellite altimetry to quantify wave height in the Bering Sea. Um, and we have a whole um, series of satellite altimeters that are measuring the surface height or topography of the ocean. Um, over time, and um, we use that to characterize the overall sea state in the Bering Sea. So you can see from this graph that the winter months are clearly the, the stormiest months, um, in particular uh, January and February, when the average significant wave height is around 2.5 to 4 meters. Um, and again, if we just look at the interannual variability, this is uh, quite a busy graph, no need to get too concerned about it, it's two different sets of altimeter uh, techniques um, or technologies, I should say, but this is showing us that on average in winter, the um, significant wave height is around three meters. Um, and we find that about 1% of the time, significant wave heights are greater than seven meters. Um, and then on average, about uh, between two and 5% of our observations show these very high and phenomenal seas where wave heights are greater than 14 meters. So we can see a lot of intraannual variability, but if we focus now on um, just the very, very large storms, these um, tropical, um, uh, these cyclones are extra tropical typhoons, um, we've found that the, um, amount of these events have increased in the last decade. In fact, 90% of the events that we studied in our time series occurred in the last 10 years. Um, and these are causing sea states of 14 meters um, or 46 feet and, and higher. So we're investigating each of these individually. And if we look at the trend from the satellite altimeters over time, we see that the prevalence of these um, winter storms as identified by the significant wave height is increasing over time. So you can see there's the linear increase and then there's, which is the solid line. And then the, um, the dotted line is the six year average. Um, so I'll just quickly conclude that basically the work that we're doing is investigating um, winter storms in the Bering Sea. And um, we have found that the frequency um, an occurrence of very high and phenomenal sea states is increasing over the 20 year time period. Um, and this has, of course, a range of socioeconomic impacts on the region, uh, not to mention um, the fishing industry 
um, but also in terms of coastal flooding, coastal erosion and structural damage on land. So with that, I, I will leave it there. Sorry for going over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sinead. That was a great presentation. Next up, we have Jeff Craven, whose presentation will focus on the National Blend of Models. Following Jeff's talk, there will be a Q&A session. To, so um, please submit any questions you have for our speakers in the, in the chat. Uh, Jeff, go ahead when you are ready, please. Thank you. So can you see my screen then? Yes, looks good. Excellent, excellent. So the National Blend of Models is a nationally consistent suite of calibrated forecast guidance. So we combine many National Weather Service models with those from several other centers uh, across the world, actually. And our last implementation was in September of a couple of years ago, and I wanted to you know, let you know that the goal of this is to uh, provide a starting point for all of our National Weather Service collaborative forecast processes. We have one that's starting with rainfall forecasts here this year, in fact, and plans for doing them for winter and uh, other uh, types of severe weather programs. One thing that uh, the Weather Service is working on presently is that we have a history over decades of producing single number deterministic forecasts, but uh, obviously forecasting is uncertain and there's a need for us to provide more and more uncertainty information uh, and confidence information. And the way to do that is to expand our guidance to a fully probabilistic uh, format to do world-class information impact-based decision support services you really need these probabilistic databases so we talked about multi-centers obviously NOAA ends up we use a lot of guidance from there but also from our friends at Fleet and Americal and the Navy from uh, Canada, the European Center, and also the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia. So this is definitely an international project in terms of data that we use. There's up to 171 members uh, for things like the probabilistic maximum temperature forecast that I'll show you an example of here shortly. Uh, the what we do is we take the model output and we use our real-time mesoscale analysis which is a gridded analysis at two and a half kilometer resolution and we use that to bias correct and downscale these models which in some cases have 100 kilometer resolution all the way down to two and a half so that improves accuracy and detail particularly for complex terrain. We have many different sectors, uh, the continental United States, but also what we call affectionately our OCONUS areas outside of the CONUS, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, and an oceanic domain at 10 kilometers resolution, which extends from Australia to Western Europe. We have some simple machine learning techniques that we use, uh, like regression. So with significant lead time, we're able to predict extreme events. Uh, and in fact, in showing this example here in a moment, uh, fairly significant lead time of five to eight days on that unprecedented heat wave in the Pacific Northwest and Southwest Canada. But it also performs well for many different kinds of events, uh, which I have listed there from winter weather to heavy rainfall and uh, marine events like high waves. So uh, showing you example forecast from the Pacific Northwest, this is a day three forecast ahead 
that was valid on June 28th, um, which was the hottest day around the Seattle area. This time, uh, three days out, the forecast for Seattle was 108 degrees, which actually is exactly what happened. Um, Portland, Oregon, around 111 and 116 degrees at the Dow's. Uh, keeping in mind that that's a deterministic forecast, but by using this rich uh, calibrated ensemble, we can look at the probabilities of exceeding 110 degrees three days out. Now, keep in mind that neither Portland, Oregon or Seattle up to this point had ever exceeded 110 degrees. So you have fairly high probabilities, 34% probability in Seattle, around 50% in Portland and an 80% chance at the Dells. Again, these are extremely high numbers for an event that at this point had, be, had never occurred. Now, keep in mind, Seattle didn't actually get to 110, but they did get to 108, uh, which was five degrees higher than their all-time record. And Portland reached 116 degrees, which was nine degrees higher than their previous all-time record. What this chart shows you is uh, for the hottest day, and again, forecasts that were eight days out here at 192 hours on the right, and then the shortest term forecasts were on the left. What this shows you is that by day six, the National Blend of Models in orange here was forecasting a June all-time record in Seattle. And by the time you got to day four or five actually, day five, it was forecasting the all-time record. Uh, so five days lead time on an all-time record. Um, on the right, you have the Portland graph, which is similar. And this bluish line is the all-time record for June. And then the all-time record for any date at 107 was this red line. Again, similar results, a six day lead time on a June record and a five day lead time on an all time record at Portland. So obviously Canada was also hot and uh, lit in British Columbia set their all time record. Um, and actually the all time record for the entire nation of Canada was set uh, during this event. Um, it was eight degrees higher than any all-time record had ever been for anywhere. And, and typically the, the highest, the hottest weather is in the plains of Canada and in the Saskatchewan, but the new record was set in, uh, in the Southern British Columbia. Um, so how did the blend do uh, on this particular event? Using the probabilistic forecast, it predicted, and this was the previous all-time record in Canada, 113 degrees here in red. It indicated a significant probability, more than 10% chance on day eight of setting the all-time record in Canada. And by day six, that probability increased to more than 50%. So significant lead time on what had previously been you know, unprecedented heat by breaking the, you know, the, the, their entire Canada record by eight degrees. And you see by day six, you start seeing probabilities of exceeding 119 degrees. Um, and so again, very impressive performance. So we found that we can get significant lead time using probabilistic information even over le our legacy deterministic forecast or single numbers. And that can happen with, with rare or unprecedented events like a heat wave. So we were working on an upgrade. We should be able to hand off code this fall for a January 2023. We're going to expand our probabilistic forecast further. We're going to have Alaska covered by these uh, probabilistic max and min temperature forecasts. Uh, we need to continue to explore AI and ML 
and leverage more sophisticated techniques in order to mine information from these ensembles and uh, using reforecast information. And we're working on by 2028 having a fully probabilistic, every element would have probabilistic information for the national blend of models. So again, if you're going to help decision makers, you need probabilistic information in order to give them the range of possibilities and confidence and alternative scenarios rather than just a sing what a single forecast number can bring. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. That was an excellent presentation. And thank you to all of our present presenters today for your great work and really informative talks. I'd like to now open it up for questions and I'll turn it back over to Katie for our question and answer se session of the uh, of the webinar. Thank you so much, Judy. This was a very impressive session. Uh, thank you all. So I'm gonna get started with a question for each, starting with Greg and Andre. Are there any plans to implement the rip current model on the Great Lakes? Yeah, I can take that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Andre. Yeah, you can take that. <laughs> yeah, I can take that one. Yeah, so uh, yes, in the Great Lakes, we also run um, a model on unstructured meshes. And so there we have all of the ingredients that we discuss for the open ocean. So we have water levels, which do not vary with tide, of course, but uh, does very slowly with lake levels and average. Um, and we have wave heights, wave directions, wave periods. So we have all of the predictors we need to drive the model. And so we have indeed started with pilot experiments of outputting the same results along the coastal contours and driving those with, with rip currents. Um, I would say that the big challenge in the Great Lakes is really getting the observations. Um, they do not have as many lifeguards in the Great Lakes as we do have on the open ocean coastline. So, um, so we would probably focus more on the remote sensing approaches such as webcams and such uh, for that validation work. But uh, it's definitely work that is already uh, ongoing. All right, thanks. Um, is the public able to access these six day predictions ahead of time along with lifeguards? Yeah, so so this, we didn't really talk about the, for, the, the entire forecasting um, uh, chain of this, but ultimately this information is guidance to our forecast offices, our coastal forecast offices. And so this makes it into the so-called beach pages um, of each forecast office. So that is the place where you can find this information um, uh, out to a forecast horizon of, of six days, as we discussed. Uh, last question, has any uh, weather forecast office been able to relate the model, to you, the model use to saving lives? Any success stories? Yeah, we, we hear good feedback um, from them. So the way that this is used is um, they get the guidance, they issue the forecast, and then they are constantly in touch with the lifeguard squads on the beaches. So at least every day during the, the swimming seasons, mm -hmm. they they have discussions with them to discuss how well the the guidance has gone and what the fatalities, the fatalities were during the during the day. And so um, uh, parts of NOAA are busy collecting this data and mapping these out. And so we're busy analyzing how well um, the model predictions are, are aligning with, with issues that were occurring and, and lives that were saved. Great, thank you both. I'm gonna move on to Stephen. Uh, so Stephen, how responsible was the US for the increase in emissions and how compliant are we? Yeah, well, it turns out NOAA and the Global Monitoring Lab also has a network of measurement sites across the U.S. So we can directly estimate from those measurements emissions for the U.S. And emissions over the U.S. for CFC-11 dropped over this period. They didn't increase. So in fact, the U.S. has did not contribute to the increase we observed in emissions during this time or the apparent violation as far as we know. Thanks. Um, is there an overarching goal in CFC, um, CFC emission reduction or atmospheric concentration? And if so, how far away are we from hitting that goal? Yeah, we actually post a website with this information. It's called the Ozone Depleting Gas Index, or ODGI, that enables us to um, track 
the progress made towards the full recovery of the ozone layer. Uh, and we do that for two different regions of the atmosphere, both mid-latitudes and Antarctica. And, and in mid-latitudes, the declines in not just CFC-11, but total ozone depleting gases have brought us about halfway back to where we might expect full recovery. Over Antarctica, the recovery has been, or the, the progress has been slower for various reasons. And we've maybe made progress amounting to about a 15 to 25% of the way back towards full recovery. And the dates expected for full recovery still are somewhere between 2050 for mid-latitudes and 2080 over the polar regions, particularly Antarctica. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Um, with our time, I'm going to move on to Sinead. Sure. Uh, so Sinead, do waves in the Bering Sea reduce ice formation? And is there a feedback loop between wave height as ice extent recedes, uh, re yeah, recedes due to the increase in fetch? Yeah, very good question. Absolutely. Um, so the impact of sea ice on the ocean, one of the impacts of the ice cover is to dampen waves. Um, so as ocean waves encounter the sea ice, they start to be moderated or modulated um, and over um, several hundred meters dissipate um, entirely. So the um, importance of sea ice in this region on wave height is, is, is definitely um, clear. Um, and yeah, so the, that's the key kind of uh, research question that we're um, trying to um, understand is that as the sea ice recedes has in fact that increased overall wave height. Um, so it's a combination of two things. We want to know if the forcing by the wind has changed. Um, so, you know, have there been more cyclones? The um, model prediction, so there's been work done by Herman et al. Um, 2019, looking at um, climate models like the CMIP-5 climate models under anthropogenic forcing, and they suggest that in, there will be an increase in southerly winds in the Bering Sea over time. So we want to take that um, uh, into consideration uh, when we're understanding the impact um, of the retreating sea ice. But um, to answer the other part of the question, absolutely, the, um, when we track these cyclones, um, we're seeing that more of them are tracking further north into the Bering Sea, um, and they're disrupting ice concentration once they um, encounter the sea ice pack. So there's a dynamically driven um, aspect to the loss of sea ice um, beyond just the warming of the Arctic region. Um, so the Arctic is warming at two to three times faster than the rest of the Earth. Um, so beyond just the warming of the region and the, and the warming um, feedback loop on the ice decline, we're also seeing a dynamic uh, feedback of these uh, winter storms on disintegrating the ice cover. Great. Um, was 2018 a year with above average storms and higher storm intensity? And is that why there was a low, a record low uh, sea ice? Uh, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, the, the record low sea ice in 2018 was really considered um, primarily due to um, warming in the, in the area. Um, but it was a perfect storm. It was described by some of my colleagues in Alaska as this perfect storm um, in the sense that there was not only atmospheric warming and ocean warming observed, but there were an increase in the number of winter storms in 2018. So um, it wasn't the stormiest winter recorded, um, but certainly it was a very stormy winter. But interestingly, in our analysis of the significant wave height, we didn't see any of these really phenomenal seas in 2018, um, in the winter of 2018 into um, the early part of 2019. We saw those in previous years and, and subsequent years. Um, so that is some, something that we're looking further into at the moment. And one last question. Uh, why do you think that 90% of your cases are in the last 10 years? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I didn't um, really get a chance to cover that. But we um, have to take into account that um, it's also a detection um, uh, uh, situation. So as we're increasing the number of satellites in orbit, 
we're observing the sea surface more frequently. So um, it's possible that our results are, uh, the results that we're seeing in terms of these really intense, very high and phenomenal sea states are a consequence of, a, of more observations. So just having more eyes in um, Earth orbit, more of these satellite altimeters taking measurements of the ocean um, and happening to um, profile the surface when these stormy events are occurring. So that's really why we're bringing in the reanalysis data um, and looking at the wind uh, speeds and, and understanding the trend there to um, rule out the possibility that we're just happening to observe these um, uh, storms more often um, through through sampling, through increased sampling. So um, yeah, another thing that we need to um, quantify. Thanks, Sinead. I'm going to move on to Jeff for our last few questions. So Jeff, uh, what is the skill of the national blend of models for flooding events? And do you have any examples? The the National Blend of Models has a fairly well calibrated probabilistic uh, quantitative precipitation forecast. Uh, we worked with Tom Hamill and OAR out in Boulder and uh, put in the latest and greatest quantile mapping and dressing code to calibrate the probability. Mm -hmm. So what what it was really designed to do is capture the high end events. But as you know, the uh, for very heavy rain events like hurricanes or other thunderstorm related events, the you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 inches of rain, it's generally a very low probability of, of occurring in a high impact sense. So, if you start to see five or 10% chances of five inches of rain, it's actually fairly significant from a, a, a skill standpoint. So uh, we mm -hmm. have noticed um, even back to Hurricane uh, Harvey in Texas that the blend was producing 30, 40 inches of rain uh, even though they ended up getting more than that. So it certainly has skill um, and we're continuing to improve that skill with time. And we're hoping to use reforecast information from the new global ensemble forecast system to uh, calibrate these extreme rainfall events even further. Thank you. We have one last question. Um, how can the use of AI and machine learning increase the accuracy of these forecasting models? One, one thing that uh, in the, the calibration and the bias correction that we currently do on the bulk covers many months or even some years of data with all flow patterns. But what we really need to do is dig into you know, having the machine learning or especially the artificial intelligence sort out particular patterns. And, you're, and it, particularly when it comes to complex terrain like, uh, like mountainous areas, the flow pattern is important. So if you're bias correcting to um, all events, but the heaviest precipitation events occur with Southwest flow only, you would, you know, to, to get the best results, you have to disaggregate all of the historical data down to flow regimes that really matter. So uh, we think that really the way to do that is through artificial intelligence so that we can look at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patterns over many decades to pick out the patterns that are most likely to produce the significant weather event, whatever it might be. And so that's what we're excited about doing um, in the future. 
Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you so much to all of our speakers. Uh, we are just over the hour, so we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, but thank you so much. We did record this, so you will be able to watch this um, on the library's YouTube channel. And uh, Judy, do you have any last words? No, I just want to thank everyone. You know, this marks the end of our 2021 NOAA Science Report series. And thanks everyone who's, who has tuned in, who have, everyone who's tuned in for the last few weeks. And thanks again to today's speakers. And um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Yes, thank you all. Uh, take care, be safe, and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. You too, so long.